All right. Good, good evening, good morning, good night, wherever you are. Uh, welcome, welcome to Orthodox Shahada. Um, I'm here today with I've I've like I'm gathering a collection of PhD Trinitarian uh, theologians <laughs> now. So I've got Bo and now I've got uh, Dr. Josh Zwade as well. Um, and Josh is here to talk to us about something that's kind of at least it's not obvious now, but to me is kind of groundbreaking is how the monarchia is being kind of pushed a bit more into the popular sphere than it is relegated to um, scholarship and stuff like that. Right. So Josh had a debate with Muhammad Hijab in the corner, which we'll review in a bit. Um, and he used the monarchia of the father to defend the Trinity. And obviously it kind of took, at least in, from my opinion, it took Muhammad Hijab off guard because he wasn't expecting it at all. And most Muslims don't expect it when you bring it up. So yeah, welcome Josh. Thank you. And welcome Bo. And yeah, so um, I've included Josh's uh, PhD dissertation in the description below. So if you want to go read it. So I just thought Josh could talk about his dissertation for a bit and, and the Trinity um, and back and forth with Bo and then we'll move on to the debate review. So go ahead, Josh. Whatever yeah. you want to say. Um, yeah, so just focusing yeah, on the sort of my research, um, I just finished my PhD in April, um, which I'm very happy that it's over because it was uh, stressful and challenging, but it was very formative. Um, but I focused on um, a specific model of the Trinity um, that was put forward by Professor Richard Swinburne. Um, so the model has been termed, it wasn't termed by him this, but it's been termed, I think those Dale Tuggy and um, Brian Leftow and a few other people, um, they call it the functional monotheism model. Um, and basically what I was trying to do was trying to show that the functional monotheism model is not subject to a very sort of pertinent objection that, that's been raised, up, um, raised against it, which has been called the tritheism objection. Um, and this objection was raised by Kelly James Clark and Edward Fezzer. This was back in the 90s. Um, and what I realized is that this um, objection hasn't actually been or wasn't addressed um, up until my thesis um, in sort of the, the contemporary literature on Trinitarianism. Because uh, the majority of people were assuming, oh, uh, Richard Swinburne's model is actually, yes, yeah, logically coherent. It makes sense. Um, there's no sort of any logical fallacies or anything like that uh, related to as other models um, sometimes a subject to, but the main issue is, oh, it's just tritheistic. Um, it doesn't really model what we understand the Trinity to be. Um, and so what I was trying to do was actually trying to say, actually, let's um, let's take a step back and let's firstly understand what, what is tritheism, um, because it's a term that's bandied around a lot. Oh, uh, this is tritheistic, but then a lot of people don't actually define what it is. Um, so what I, what I really sought to do was to say, let's um, sort of take a historical analysis of this and then off of this historical analysis, I want to assess if the model does sort of affirm the central elements of um, tritheism. Um, and so what I did at sort of the beginning of my thesis was to look at um, tritheism as it was developed by a philosopher um, in the 6th to the 7th century, um, John Philoponus. Because um, he was sort of the main individual who was um, at that time was sort of popularizing this idea of a tritheistic view of God. And then he was ultimately condemned um, at one of the ecumenical councils. And so what I said was, well, because an ecumenical council has sort of um, shown this view to be wrong, um, and they basically said, this is tritheism. And if you hold to tritheism, uh, tritheism then that's heretical. I said, OK, let me take that as the standard of tritheism. And then let me assess if the model does fit into that view of tritheism. And then I sort of went through it and I was saying, actually, um, some elements of the model does seem to be sort of fitting with this view. Um, but I said, when we sort of utilize um, some philosophical concepts to sort of further elucidate um, the, the sort of view of tritheism that I was, um, was trying to demonstrate, you do actually see that the model doesn't really affirm the central elements. And so it shouldn't be... Uh, term tritheistic. I called it classical tritheism. So I said it shouldn't be um, classed as sort of a classical tritheistic view um, of the Trinity. Um, I said I'm open for other people to say maybe a different form of tritheism. Um, it does sort of like sort of affirm the central elements of it and should be termed tritheistic in that sense. 
But I said, well, if we're taking classical tritheism and uh, tritheism that's been sort of rejected by an ecumenical council, then we can't class this theory as tritheistic. Um, so then after I did that, I then said, um, okay, let's say it's not tritheistic. Should we then class it as a monotheistic view of God or a monotheistic view um, of, of the Trinity? And so then what I did was saying, okay, let's perform a further historical analysis and let's say what are the important understandings of monotheism in um, what I called was pro-Nicene Trinitarianism, uh, which stems from another theologian, Lewis Sayers. Um, and I was saying, well, when we look at this, and um, we take the central elements of each of these sort of concepts of pro-Nicene Trinitarianism, the model actually, once it's modified in certain ways philosophically, it does actually affirm these concepts of monotheism. So I took like monotheism to be, um, let's say we take the one God to be the father, so the, um, the monarchy of the father. Um, and then I said, actually, it does. If you we sort of modify the model, it does actually affirm the monarchy of the father. Um, and then I said, okay, if we take the one um, God to refer to the divine nature, that there's a there's one divine nature shared between each of the persons, it does affirm that as well. And then I said, if we take um, the one God to refer to the Trinity as a whole, um, I then sort of tried to show that it does affirm that as well. So each of these views of monotheism, which were prevalent um, in sort of that Trinitarian tra uh, trajectory, um, the model does seem to affirm each of them. And so it should be classed as monotheistic in each of those senses. Um, and so then my conclusion was that the model um, is not tritheistic, um, but is a logically possible or logically coherent model of the Trinity in each of those three senses. That was sort of my uh, conclusion. Maybe a bit of a boring conclusion, but I just felt I was able to um, just show that the model maybe is, is um, it can be you know utilized um, as a monotheistic view of God, and we don't we shouldn't just sort of just class as tritheistic. We should actually say actually maybe Swinburne's put some put forward something which actually is very fruitful. Let's sort of research further into it, and we shouldn't just class it as tritheistic from the beginning. Maybe there is further things we we can do with the model. That was sort of my my uh, position on it. I wonder, like, just for the sake of people who are listening, might not be familiar with Swinburne's model, like, <clears throat> maybe you just give a layman's terms kind of run down of that. And also maybe um, I'm hijacking from Lewis, but like, like John Philopinus, like what was, what was it about yes. his view that, that got him in trouble for people who okay. don't know? Yeah, perfect. Um, so Swinburne's view, um, sort of the most basic level, is that there are three divine persons. So there's three persons. Um, and sort of he, he takes a person to be a mental substance, to like a, a being that has intentionality, a will, um, has beliefs, has uh, uh, certain powers. So you have these three persons. And each of these three persons instantiate um, the divine nature. And he defines the divine nature as the property of essential omnipotence. So each of the, the each of the persons have this property um, called essential omnipotence, and then Swinburne sort of has further arguments that from essential omnipotence you get the other divine properties um, that sort of flow from it: omniscience, perfect goodness, and eternality. But basically, at the most at basic level, each of the divine persons have um, this property of essential omnipotence, um, and then the relation between the persons is that they are mutually interdependent. Um, in that the father inevitably brings into existence um, the son. And then I think Swinburne sort of holds to uh, the filioque. So he then says uh, the father and the son then inevitably cause to exist um, the spirit. And um, what this causes is sort of like a, um, a unified community. Um, because each, each of the persons are mutually interdependent in that if one of them didn't exist and the other two wouldn't exist, they sort of form this community um, of perfect persons. And then what he basically says is that this community is to be taken as the one God. So if you say the Trinity is the idea that there are three divine persons and there is one God, he identifies the one God um, most explicitly as the Trinity, as the community that these three divine persons uh, form because of their mutual interdependence. Um, yeah, that's sort of at the most basic level, this idea mm -hmm. that the three persons who are each divine because of essential omnipotence, and then they are each related to each other um, in that the Father, Son, 
cause a spirit and the father causes uh, the son to exist and they they rely on each other um, and then they form this community and this community um, is to be uh, referred to as the one god um, and then yeah so then philoponus uh, Philoponus sort of had the view that um, he's had a very similar view in that there are three, I, I don't think he would say they're persons, I don't think they had that developed view, but let's say that there are three sort of individuals in the, in the Trinity, um, and then each of these individuals in the Trinity are to be taken, this is the way I sort of interpreted it in my thesis, um, as Aristotelian substances. So basically, each of the persons are ontologically um, independent beings. So where it's sort of different from Swinburne is that Swinburne is saying they are each mutually interdependent in that each of them have to um, have to exist for the others to exist. Um, but Philopolis had the view that actually they are all they are each individuals who are ontologically independent and so are Aristotelian substances. Um, and then I sort of sort of try to in my thesis I try to use sort of a contemporary. Um, sort of analysis of what an Aristotelian substance is to sort of make more sense of that. But the idea is just that they're, they are each ontologically in, um, independent. Did he ever say that um, like the father could exist without the son or something like that? Yes, yeah, yeah, no, he did have that view. Um, the, the sort of view that he, he was trying to put forward was that it seemed like um, each of the, the persons were part of their own species. He used like the, the term mm -hmm. that each of them had their own species. So it seemed to be like there wasn't any dependence relations between the persons, that it seemed to be like the Father, Son, and the Spirit could exist without each other. Right. Um, they, they just sort of have a, um, what he, he had the view was that they had like a, um, a mind dependent uh, sort of um, unity in that <clears throat> in that they are not united together in in ontologically in 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 a real sense, but they in our minds we can understand them to be united. And the way he sort of tries to argue that is that he doesn't believe that they um he sort of rejects a view of universals. Mm -hmm. um, so he doesn't believe that they all instantiated the universal of divinity, and so he believes that they sort of each have their own property. Um, I sort of, in my thesis, I, I try to do sort of like a trope analysis of it to say maybe that he That's had- what I was just thinking, yeah. Yeah, sort of like they had sort of their, their own um, individual tropes of divinity. Right, right. You can cash it out in that way. Um, so let's say that they each have their own trope of divinity um, and their own, the only unity that we can, we can get from that, we extract from that a unity that is dependent in our minds. Right. Um, so how there's one God, if we're talking God in the sense of the one divine nature, is because the, um, because of this mental abstraction, we can believe there to be this unity in essence. But in reality, they are all they are each individual person or individuals um, who are ont ontologically independent and they each have their own trope of divinity. Um, and so that was sort of the, the view that I took. And I said, well, if we look at Swinburne's view, it doesn't seem to fit into that view metaphysically or in, or in any theological sense. And so I try to show how it doesn't affirm that view that Philopolis is trying to put forward. Right. Mm. Bo, you're, yeah. you're quite critical of the um, Swinburne model, it seems to me, at least from all the... Uh, well, it depends. I, th I think, um, I mean, so, so one thing I, I would be critical of is identifying, well, I don't know if I would be critical of this, but so I tend to want to identify the one God as the Father. But on the other hand, I think it kind of just depends on what you mean by the word God. So, um, and actually I emailed Swinburne about this not too long ago. And, and I, I asked about that. And I mean, that this is basically his response to, he was just like, yeah, it depends on what you mean by the word God. If you mean, you know, one thing then it's the Father. And if you mean this other thing then it's the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So if you mean something like, you know, the the monarchia, right? Like the, the uncaused cause, then that's the father, but. Does he believe that they all have their own distinct individual wills and minds? Yeah, that was one thing I was gonna ask about that. I mean, that that's, as I've understood, it's been a while since I read Swinburne's thing, but as I understood it, they, um, they have their own distinct sort of faculty of yeah. will, and then they just necessarily agree because they're, omnibenevolent and they know that 
it's better all to, you know, all things considered if they agree on something. That's a big issue. So Scott Williams just came out with a paper on that, uh, responding to Hasker, who was responding to one of his papers before. Like, that's a big issue with a lot of the social models of the Trinity is like, how do you get necessary agreement among the persons? So I think the traditional view was that they literally, I mean, would be, depending on your metaphysics, something like, they just have a single trope of divinity that's shared between them or whatever. Or in the case of the faculty of will, there's just a single faculty that they share between them. And so there's no possibility for disagreement. But if you if you think of them as like distinct minds or something that have their distinct wills, then you have to come up with some kind of story about like why they don't disagree with each other. But I think a big part of the monarchy, I think a big part of the idea was like, we want something where there's not going to be any possibility of disagreement like there is among the Greek gods or something like that. Like it's not that, like that just doesn't even come into the picture, I think, for for most of the church fathers. Yeah, just just commenting on that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, that's exactly it. Yeah, so Swinburne does sort of take the view that they each have their own will. Um, and But the way sort of that he gets agreement is he sort of takes it in two ways. So he says, on any moral matter, um, because they are each perfectly good, they will just agree yeah. in their decisions. But where you get sort of the disagreement is about non-moral matters. Um, mm -hmm. So I think he uses the example about um, sort of the, I think it was about the sun. Um, mm -hmm. So if the... The sun in the sky. If the, if the um, one of the divine persons wanted it to rotate in one way, and another divine person wanted yeah. it to rotate in another way, you'll seem to have like a clash of um, a clash of volitions. And so the way that he sort of tries to show that that's um, sort of logically possible is um, by sort of saying that there is a mechanism in place, um, mm -hmm. but then grounds this mechanism interest on the father. Um, so he basically says because the father is the cause of the son and the spirit, um, he basically says that, because um, he assumes sort of a moral view where sort of um, you need to uh, sort of obey your benefactors. So he takes this view where you basically need to obey your benefactors. And he says, because there is this moral truth that you need to be obedient to your benefactors, because the father is the cause of the son and the spirit, um, he is their greatest benefactor. And so, um, there would be this sort of moral truth that sort of grounds this idea that he can then um, make the decision to um, sort of uh, assign specific uh, spheres of activity so that the father will act in one way and he will sort of initiate an action in one way and then the son will initiate an action another way and the spirit in another way. And um, because they are perfectly good again, they will just obey that sort of mechanism and they would just go about acting and initiating things in their own um, sphere of activity and then in any other sphere of activity they because it's sort of a wrong action to, to you know initiate an action in that uh, in a sphere of activity that's not yours um they would just then cooperate with that other divine person and so basically just says because it's grounded by the father there's this mechanism that allows them not to have this clash of wills um, and then he says that this is sort of the way to make sense of it. But yeah, I do, I do remember Scott Williams sort of had an issue with that uh, specifically. He said he just doesn't see it to be sort of a moral truth that you need to even obey your greatest benefactors and stuff like that. So Swinburne needed to argue a little bit further why we should hold to that even being a moral truth. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Swinburne's actually responded to him or Hasker has maybe on his behalf or something. Hasker has recently and then... I think Scott like just came out with a paper about it, but yeah. but um, <clears throat> yeah. So I might, I mean, yeah. There's some the, the multiple wills and multiple minds view isn't like traditional either, though. Like even, mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are like PhD oh. philosophers, but for me, it's always just is the weight of tradition behind it. Yes, no. <laughs> so I mean, like I don't, I I, yeah. I like for me, it's always going to cash out yeah. the tradition, but yeah, yeah. I mean. Um, so, Josh, did you want to talk about um, kind of your 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 view back in 2018, and then after yeah. doing your research, and then yeah. um, uh, then talk a bit yeah. about Speakers Corner, and then we can do the debate review. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So um, when I started my research um, on this, um, which it actually wasn't at the beginning of my PhD, I actually I sort of 
decided to go down a different path for my research and focus more on the Trinity. So this was about a year and a half ago when I, when I made that change. Um, and I sort of had the view, if I'm honest, I had more Swinburne's view that the Trinity is the divine community. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the, the one God is a divine community. Um, and so when we are talking about one God, when we are praying to God, we are praying to each of the three persons. So I had the view sort of that God is tri-personal, which you'll probably hear all the time that we believe in a tri-personal God. So that was my view. Um, and you had three divine persons, one God who is um, the community. Uh, but then just sort of going into sort of more the historical sort of um, side of my studies, I just sort of realized that I don't think that that view had a lot of, again, what you were saying, sort of the weight of tradition behind it. When you actually look yeah. into it, um, one thing that sort of stuck out to me was like, okay, let's just look at the Nicene Creed, um, you know, let's say <laughs> or Constantinople. I mean, how does it even start off? I believe in yeah. one God, but then how do they qualify that God or who do they identify that God as? They don't identify it as the Trinity, they identify it as a father. And that was quite problematic for me. And, and also it was quite interesting because when I was reading Swinburne's work, Swinburne actually tackles that and he says that, I don't know why, but he just says that the one God refers to the Trinity, but then he doesn't actually show it how it does. So basically that first sentence that you find in the Nicene Creed, he says the one God and he, he lays it out, but then he says it refers to the Trinity. And for me, I was like, but <laughs> they qualify as the father and that was quite problematic for me. Um, and then just sort of reading more into like the Cappadocians, uh, so Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzus, um, I just saw such a sort of clear sort of teaching that there is this sort of, um, identification as, as God as the Father, and I didn't really see this idea of a tripersonal God. Um, but then I did sort of notice that you do see sort of a, a shift in this when you look at Augustine's work, because um, Augustine did feature in my, my, my thesis as well, and I was like, actually, you do see him referring to the one God as, as a trinity. You do see him sometimes use God as also in a sort of a monarchical sense, but um, he's not very consistent, and he also refers to the trinity. And so for me, I just, I felt that there was, I think this is very similar to your your thesis, uh, Dr. Branson, about um, sort of this Western sort of break off and things like that with the monarchy and things like that. And I did really notice that, that when you look at the Cappadocians, you look at more the sort of the Eastern Fathers, you don't see this view of the, the tripersonal God being the one God. You see it as the Father. Yeah. And so for me, it was, a, it was a breath of fresh air. It was like a radical change. Uh, when I looked into the historical work, but then also when I looked into your work as well, um, specifically that that um, that PowerPoint you did, and I think it was featured on Trinities with yeah. Dale Tuggy, sort of where I accessed it, and it, it was like literally a breath of fresh air. I was like, wow, this just makes sense. Yeah, um, it makes sense of the, the the fathers. It makes sense of scripture as well. So I looked back at scripture and I said, well, actually, when you look at God, when it's normally used sort of a, in a nominal sense as a name, it doesn't refer to the Trinity, it refers to the Father. And so for me, I was like, this is this is an amazing view that everyone needs to know uh, because <laughs> number one, it deals with a lot of objections to, um, I think this is sort of a segue to uh, Speaker's Corner, uh, because I've been going to the corner for uh, about four years or so, and you'll always hear objections specifically from Muslims that show me in the Bible where the one God is a trinity, where God is tripersonal, you know. Um, right. what, when God, when when um, Jesus says there's one true God, and, you know, when um, Paul refers to the one God, the Father, and when Jesus says, I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God, who is he referring to? What do you mean? Uh, and so for me, that was always an issue. Um, and I try my best to address it, but I never was satisfied in my mind. But then once I understood this idea of the monarchy and specifically that it had this weight of tradition behind it, so it wasn't like a sort of a, a new view that just came about, but it's, it's the historical view. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. It, it makes sense. Yeah. And all these objections just fall to the wayside. Um, and, you know, so I, for me, I was like, I need to go and, uh, much as possible get back to the corner and need to publicize this as much as I can because I think a lot of Christians need to know about this view, number one, yeah. and the Muslims as well, um, I think they need to know about this because it's an issue for a lot of their objections. They'll realize that actually it's not applicable to the traditional historical or orthodox view of Trinitarianism. Um, yeah, so just speaking a little bit more about Speaker's Corner, um, like I was saying, I've been there for four years and I had great conversations with with Muslims. If I'm honest, I've 
I've actually really enjoyed myself. I've built good relationships with them. Um, the way I, I felt going about it was just to be a little bit more relational um, and not always arguing, but just trying to actually hear them out and listen to what they're saying. Um, but I've had a good time uh, going there and speaking to quite a few of them. Um, but I took a break about a year a year ago just to focus more on my studies and family. But then it was just the past week I, I returned to the corner and I'm hoping to be a bit more frequent there. And I think I'm just going to be slamming people with this monarchy of the father. <laughs> That's going to be the main, the main thing I want to speak about with people. Uh, just to say, how are you going to tackle this issue? Because it is I, a, I think... I think yeah. we have a few new people in the chat who are just getting a bit like, you know, when people first hear this, it's like, oh, what you mean? So this, so the Son and the Holy Spirit aren't God, and it's like, no, like just go watch the series we've done yeah. already. I, I, we're not going through it here. Just go watch the series. Yes, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit are God. Yes, go, just go look yeah. at the series we've done, and yeah. So a, anything else you want to say about Speaker's Corner or? Yeah. So. Um... Generally, I, I really believe that we are blessed to have a place like that because if I understand in other parts of the world, you don't have a, an area where, you know, each week you have different people from different worldviews uh, mm -hmm. coming together to discuss something like this and have debates and have discussions. Um, and a lot of them can be fruitful discussions as well. I think you even get like, um, I, I met one uh, flat earther there one time. Yeah, like this flat earth movement, there was a period when, I think it was two years ago, where they came all in droves and they would speak about flat earthism. I never would have met someone like that probably. So for me, I'm like, it's an amazing place where you, make, you meet different people of different worldviews and you can hash out your views as well. And I found I've developed theologically going there because a lot of things that I feel, oh, make sense in my mind, when I actually say to someone who's you know, let's say quite intellectual, but has a different worldview for me, and they raise objections and they raise issues and they do this and that. And for me, it's really helped me develop theologically. Um, but one thing I would say is that I would love to have a lot more Christians there. Um, you do get Christians, but for me, what I do notice a lot is the frequency of, of Muslims there is, is very high. You'll, you'll have a lot of Muslims who go there very weekly weekly they'll go there all the time they develop sort of a, a base there and they have like um um you know a lot of following there and i think it's good if we can just have more of a christian basis there i think will be very fruitful for us um and to be a lot more united because i think you have a lot of christians who you know maybe believing different things and singing off a different hymn sheet and so one christian is contradicting another christian and that cannot be very helpful. I mean, I think I'm adding to this as well with this monarchy view. <laughs> I've become, maybe they're going to call me the heretic of the corner now or something. Like that. I don't know. But I think it's good if we can be more united there and use that place evangel evangelistically because I think it's very, very, very fruitful as a platform just to bring even these scholarly ideas to a popular level, which we wouldn't have that sort of um, opportunity in, a, in another place. So I think it's a very good place. I love more people to come. Um, it's on a Sunday or thing like that would be really, really good. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I, I like Speaker's Corner. I think it's, it's a very good thing that it exists. Um, but yeah, we do need, there definitely does need to be more more Christians there who are solid in the Trinitarianism. Did you get the chance to talk to Hashim about this, by the way? I didn't. You know what? I, Hashim is probably the number one person I've spoken to the most there. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it is. Um, but I didn't. Um, I What happened was I wasn't able to spend a long time there. I'm going there this Sunday, though, so hopefully I will be able to have a chat with him. I think he'll be the main person I want to talk to. But, I, yeah, I, I ended up speaking to another person before, Sabor, um, who's another Muslim there. And then I spoke to Mohammed Dijab, and I think it just the conversation was quite long, so then I had to leave. Uh, but I did see Hashim about, but I think next week I will put this by him because I think he's the, he's the main Trinitarian guy there, so... It'd be good to have a chat with him about this view because, yeah. So when I was speaking to Sabor, funny enough, um, he said that he's going to actually mess it. He's going to send uh, your video, uh, Doctor Branson, to your your PowerPoint presentation to Hashim. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. He wanted to send it to him so he can. He never heard of it before, so that'll be interesting. Maybe because he, you know, he'll probably watch it hopefully, and then we can have a fruitful discussion about it. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Just one more thing as well. I noticed in your yeah. debate, the concept of energies doesn't really figure in your defense. Is there a reason for that? or? Yeah, um, I don't know if that's sort of showing my cards about theologically where I'm at with that. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Um, just coming from more a, 
uh, 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 like a Catholic view on things. I'm trying to sort of get my head around this idea of energy and trying to make sense of it and how you can have that with the idea of simplicity and things like that. So uh, that doesn't feature, but I think more research into it in my end will, will help and pay off and maybe that can be more fruitful in, in making sense of this Trinitarian view. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, just going into speaker's corner now and then uh, and the debate is, because um, I watched the one you had with Sabor first, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to make one observation about that discussion, was that for the whole like 20 minutes or whatever, you were just kind of talking about uh, generic stuff, but Sabor kept saying over and over again that, you know, not everyone has the brains to get into these kind of like deep theological issues and, you know, uh, like deep philosophical theological issues. So really there should be some other reasons why you accept or discount a religion. And then he just does an about face and does this critique of the Trinity, like, mm. <laughs> which I just thought was a bit bizarre because it's, it's, it's kind of like either you're going to get into the deep philosophy and theology and, and use that as an, as an accept or reject criterion for choosing a religion or you're not at which point yeah. don't, don't why are you going to get into the trinity issue you can just yeah, accept it yeah. on mystery like you do other stuff in islam right so that was just one thing that confused me about what the paul was saying that i would have called him out on uh, yeah. well, where I, are think, the... I think it's an inconsistency um and i think i see this a lot when you because what happened was this was uh, i think a lot of it wasn't actually video in our conversation it was just sort of the tail end 20 minutes um but we were talking about sort of um he was trying to I asked him actually, why do you believe Islam to be true? That's sort of how the conversation started. Um, and he was saying, well, if you believe that there's one God, it sort of entails Islam to be true. And I just said, I just don't see that. I mean, if you think Jews and Christians also see monotheism, and so you will have to say that actually entails at least at a minimum, um, these three views. And so then how do you make sense of this? And then um, he was saying, well, it then sort of led to the Trinity. He said, well, but we can just reject the view of the Trinity. And then that's sort of how it led to me, this idea of the monarchy of the Father. I said, actually, no, if you understand the Trinity correctly, it does actually fit uh, very, very neatly with a, mo a monotheistic view of God. Um, but then he was trying to argue in a way that saying, well, because I raised initially, I said, but he, yeah, he said to me that, um, these are all philosophical problems for Trinitarians and, and Christians, but we don't have it, this in Islam. And I said, actually, that's not very true. I mean, if not you, true. yeah, I mean, even philosophically, we share difficulties that we need to work on. How do we make sense of the idea of omniscience and God having foreknowledge and us having free will? And I said, oh, well, I, I mean, there's even Islam specific exactly, yeah. stuff. Like, exactly. um, I want to send you just three three books to read on Islamic theology. And then if you have that, you're going to be able to go into speaker's corner and it's going to be mm -hmm. like easy. That's nice. like, I like that. I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, right. Let's get into this debate review. Okay. So I'm going to share screen and hopefully share audio. Uh, try capturing a different screen. Uh, okay, it's going to be it's being difficult for some reason. I remember it did this last time, but then I made it work somehow. If it doesn't work, then I'll just, I've got notes anyway. Okay. Uh, um, maybe if I do that. Is that working? Yes, yeah, it's come up now. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have to do it individually for each one. So, okay. so here, so before we, before I start playing, um, I just want to. There's a couple of themes to Muhammad Hijab's kind of complaints about the Trinity that I keep hearing over and over again, um, and one of them is how he he keeps demanding that there be this kind of explicit formulaic statement in the Anti-Nicene Fathers that that the, mm -hmm. the Son and the Spirit are co co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Have you noticed that? I mean, that is more or less explicit in Irenaeus. Like there, there are passages where he says, yeah, the father has always had his logos with him. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just kind of, it's weird specific word criteria, but also they all believed like anti-Nicene like so Justin Martyr, Irenaeus and all that. 
they believed in the spirit and the sun as a uh, creator, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how could they be anything other than co-eternal? And yeah. he's it doesn't make much logical sense to say that everything was created by the Son of God, but the Son of God is created. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think about that, Josh? It seems to me he gets this from the Athanasian Creed. Like he thinks the Athanasian Creed is kind of like the staple standard. Trinitarian. Yeah, yeah. Very, very much. So. I think he was. What I did notice it, this sort of happened. I think we'll see this at the end. But he, I think he was getting confused with the creeds. And so what I realized is that he was taking the Athanasian creed to be the creed that you find at Constantinople. Yeah. So he's basically saying that, well, this is the standard. This is how we need to take it. It does say the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Um, and then he was saying, well, this is you know, the view, and it's the Augustinian view, so this is, the, this is Trinitarianism. And so I think he, it was just a misunderstanding of actually creedal history and saying what are the creeds and what do they state and, and things like that. And I think that just set him off on the wrong path of understanding even this view. And that's why I think there was a lot of misconceptions about things. Um, just, I think he just didn't grasp with the difference in the creeds um, and things like that. Um, and so I was just trying to emphasize to him that the Athanasian creed just doesn't have ecumenical weight. I mean, it doesn't have that conciliar sort of authority. And so it doesn't need to be taken as authoritative in understanding the Trinity. Um, but I think, yeah, that was a misconception. I, I do agree with you. I think, it's, I think it's not just him, but a lot of speakers at uh, Speakers Corner, they have this view that you need to have a, you know, slap bang Trinitarianism in, in, a, in, a, in one of the fathers or at least more of the fathers before Nicaea for there to be continuity from the, uh, you know, the apostolic age and things like that up until Nicaea. And I think it's just, uh, again, a misunderstanding of of the sort of theological developments and and the history of Trinity and Trinitarian. Yeah, this it's is one of the really problematic to me, uh, especially for Islam, because so you know one response I give to Christians a lot of times about that is like the the stuff that all Christians, I mean, it's just flat out in the New Testament about the Messiah is not like stated in any nice, neat little form anywhere in the old testament like it's you've got to grab stuff from all over and put it into a pack and especially i would think with islam like where is this stuff about there's going to be a final prophet who's going to come from like not the jews but from their relatives and it i mean that seems like stuff that they kind of grab from different parts of the bible and it's not like laid out anywhere nicely that oh, the church is going to become corrupt and then we're going to need a final revelation and then that one's not, I mean, like where is that all nicely and neatly in the Christian yeah. tradition? Well, it's, it? the it's the same in Islam though as well. Like um, the mainstream Sunni, Ash'ari and Maturidi views mm -hmm. on the, ex the, the formulaic descriptions of what categories the attributes are, what their status is, right. um, you know, uh, what the meanings of the different parts of the Quran when they talk about Allah having a hand or having eyes and stuff like that, what they mean. Like, none of that's explicated by the Salaf, who are the first three or four, whatever, generations after Muhammad. And then after the Salaf, you have these big debates where you have groups that are just, they believe in like, like super duper, mega apophatic theology where God is just so transcendent. You just, you can't even say anything about him, period. And then there's the view that's like mega anthropomorphous, like God is like, actually, he has a body. He's somewhere with, you know, he's got hands and all this stuff. And then it actually takes a while. And then there's the big controversy with the Matazala that happens. And it takes a while for these things to be hashed out, even in Sunni Islam. Yeah. So it's about 300 years, to be honest. So it's kind of weird it's kind of a weird thing to demand like a specific formula when there's no specific formula like the critique just goes it goes the same problem on on both yeah. sides so i i uh, and then and then the other theme um before we start playing the video is this impression that augustine is somehow the be all end all of trinitarian yeah. theology yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, i uh, mean yeah i think with that it's because Obviously, Augustine has some, you know, specifically in West, Western Christianity, he's had sort of that influence. They just assume that 
you know, in every area of theology, Augustine's the main guy that we need to sort of look to. I mean, Augustine could be helpful in certain areas, but other things he could be wrong in. Um, and so I think it was just, again, for me, it's just a, it's a lack of understanding about sort of, yes, you know, even who were the thinkers at that specific time, who were the individuals who were actually more in influential in sort of formulating the, the doctrine of that time. And I think he just sort of took a, a broad br a brush approach that Augustine is influential in every area, influential in general, so he's influential in every area. And so if Augustine doesn't agree with that view, then you're heretical. And I think he actually starting to call me a heretic because maybe I don't share the Augustinian interpretation of the Trinity. Um, and so, again, I think it's just, for me, just a lack of lack of understanding about the historical developments of of uh, the doctrine, doctrine, yeah. One thing, by the way, to to note is even with Augustine, like it mostly what happens is people just read the De Trinitate about the Trinity, and all throughout there he says that you know the the Trinity is the one God. He talks about God who's the Trinity. But the interesting thing is, like outside of the De Trinitate, he almost never speaks that way. Like if you if you're just reading his homilies or like other stuff that he wrote, like usually the word God does just refer to the father when it's not like qualified in any other way and stuff. So um, people kind of focus on the De Trinitate and also they focus on only certain books in the De Trinitate, too. So so um, e even with Augustine, I think, I mean, he starts to make that shift, I think, for a, some very particular kind of rhetorical reasons, like he makes that move in the De Trinitate. But uh, by the way, that, br that brings up something. He, one of the things that came up in this, in this debate was um, he asked like if anyone ever explicitly says that God, the word God is used in different senses. Um, and uh, you were sort of, th I think you didn't know off the top of your head, but uh, I was thinking, so, John of Damascus does explicitly say that in book three, chapter four of the exact exposition. So he explicitly says um, the word divinity or deity, like theo, uh, theotis in Greek, just refers to the divine nature. But he says the word theos, God, can sometimes mean a person and sometimes it means the nature. Uh, and so, yeah, that's useful. Very, very useful. I don't know if anyone yeah. before that origin uh, mentions that. I mean, he's kind of you know suspect, I guess, a little bit. But he does make that point, and he makes the point about the the definite article. So in in his commentary on John in the second book or chapter, whatever it is, I, I guess it's his book two, chapter one. But he says. Uh, he says he notices that in John, he says like John tends to use when he uses the article O Theos, it's referring to the Father, and then when he's referring to the Son, it's Theos without the the definite article. And of course, the Cappadocians were all you know if they didn't always agree with Origen, they were big you know fans of his. They read him and everything, and they you know so um, it's not in a way surprising to find that they kind of have that same usage. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, one thing is that um, I want to start playing now, but there is kind of a couple of million dollar questions at the end from this debate. And um, I think it will strongly relate to one of the things you've gone over, Bo, is the concept of verbal disagreement versus substantive yeah. disagreement. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. So I'll just um, play this first clip. Wait, is that the clip? Here's the clip. Yes. Is it? The father uh, is the son. Has he got the ability to generate the father? No, no. it's logically impossible. Yeah, it's logically impossible because the father, by definition, yeah, by essential definition, yeah. is an. So, so would you say? Oh, good. So, would you say then, is there a hierarchy in father, son, Holy Spirit? There is a relational hierarchy. Yes. yes. I have no problem. Uh, and is that so? This is Arianism, right? It's not. One second. That is not Arianism. You don't know what you're talking about. That is not Arianism. <laughs> Okay. No, no, man. All right, fine, fine. You said relations, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Arianism is an ontological support. Yeah, yeah. Fine, fine, fine. I did not say that. So, 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 you're not saying that. Fine, relational, right? No problem. Is there an ability? Okay, fine. Here's my here's my point, right? My point is this: when you say it's a functional hierarchy or relational hierarchy, would you say functional? What do you guys think of that? The um, 
Well, that's just Arianism, isn't it? Yeah. Bam. It's just Arianism. Yeah. <laughs> I, I noticed about this, uh, and I noticed this in a lot of these debates, is that people seem, for whatever reason, they, they want to change the terms of the debate in... Um, in, in ways, I mean, of course, to, to change the words around, you have to be assuming that the different words kind of mean the same thing as the other ones, but that then they don't really. So like this, the ontological subordination, like what Arianism says is that the father and the son have different natures, right? So their, their intrinsic essence is different, you know? So like if the you know, if the father was a cat, the son would be a dog or something. You know, they're, they're different kinds of things. And, um, you know, and you can replace that with ontological subordination or something like that. But but then he started t trying to put in like the fact that the father can generate the son and the son doesn't generate the father is like ontological subordination. But it's like, well, then now it doesn't mean the same thing because that, that doesn't have anything to do with whether they have the same intrinsic nature or not yeah yeah i think um for me uh he yeah he, i think he didn't understand about the i mean as sort of you see in sort of the, the historical development of the idea that you know the, the the persons are individuated by their their relational sort of if we use the term properties yeah. um and that's not to do with that idea of their intrinsic essence. So the intrinsic essence that they share is the same. However, they might differ in their relational or relations to each other and their relational properties. Um, but then I think he was just classing the relational properties and the sort of essence that they share together and saying, oh, because the father now has a different relational property to the son, oh, that means they must have a different essence um, when we're talking about their yeah. intrinsic essence. And, um, I was just because the problem is because that even though that is a great place to debate, it's it's so like fast paced and yeah. you have people shouting and you have pressure, so you you have to think on the spot, and so it's difficult trying to say you know what these issues are very very nuanced, and so you do need to understand the meaning of the terms when we're using these words, and you can't just class maybe these you know essential attributes that they have as relational attributes and and their um, sort of intrinsic attributes together and. In some way, I was trying to say that, but I think it was just, um, I don't know if it came across him, but I think at some point he sort of understood it. But then I think we'll see later, he was saying, oh, but then the, he has a problem now with this idea that they have a, um, he used the term attributive subordination, which I've, I've never heard of that before. <laughs> yeah. I think he says later that there's, he has a problem that they have an attributive distinction, that they have different attributes. But then I said later, I think we'll see that. Well, if they didn't have different attributes, then they'll be the same. They'll be identical, and and then that would be, you know, a heretical sort of position. Uh, I, I don't. I don't mean to press this button too hard, Josh. Yes. Um, but we do have slightly different views still because you're a Roman Catholic and we're Orthodox. Do you think that the fact that you because so for us there are real distinctions between the idioma and the persons mm -hmm. um so but you are thinking you are you, you are putting more emphasis on the relational aspect which is typically western trinitarian theology do you think that do you guys think that has anything to do with it because for me i would have just been like there's hypostatic properties idioma then there's the properties of the nature and I would have just yeah. said, I would just said, yes, there's an ontological quote unquote subordination at the level of hypostasis, but yeah, you know, not in a relevant, not in the relevant sense of subordination by nature, as in there's different natures. What, what do you, what's your yeah. take on that? Yeah, no, I think uh, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. If I'm honest, with the, um, he sort of when he asked me about my my own theological position, he put, sort of put me on the spot. So I'm just saying more personal things. I am deciding actually between catholicism and orthodoxy um and so i'm not actually a catholic but i've i've been sort of going to a catholic church for quite a while um mm. but i was prior to that going to an orthodox church and i've just been literally on this journey for like three years um just trying to understand which one i want to go so maybe off the air we can have maybe we can see <laughs> yeah, with you. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't i just i mean i i didn't know how strong you were in your catholicism yeah, yeah, no, so. no, no, no. I'm, I'm literally so it's uh it's been a back and forth for me with which position 
um, is correct. And actually, a lot of the time, I'm actually inclined a lot with orthodoxy more than Catholicism about issues. But yeah, we can discuss that later. Um, but I would, I would actually not disagree with what you've said, um, your viewpoint. I just think I just didn't focus on that for some yeah, reason. Yeah, no, in debate is heated, yeah. Well, I, if I'm honest, if I, I think if that was brought up, unless you're sort of having a little bit more time to define the terms, even what a hypostasis is, for me, he would just jump on it and say, oh, yeah, there's another, I mean, you'll struggle in to mm. even like get quite far with, mm. with that discussion. Um, One thing I thought of after the fact here, I mean, it's, you're right, These this venue is kind of like you have to have quick things to, like, it's not really, it doesn't lend itself to very deep conceptual analysis. But one of the things that I would have said about, um, I mean, you know, when you get the, this objection, like, well, the father can produce a divine person and the son can't or doesn't or whatever, the son doesn't produce the father. But, um, I mean, you might put it this way, um, producing, uh, you know, causing the existence of an uncaused person is something the father can't do either. <laughs> right. If you think about it that way, I mean, like, like you were saying, by definition, the father is supposed to be uncaused and that so the son can't cause his existence because that would be a contradiction. Um and he was kind of trying to say, yeah, well, that shows there's a difference between them, right? Because the father can cause him, but he can't cause him. But if you if you think about it in terms of like, well, neither one can cause the existence of an uncaused person. Yeah. So in that sense, if you look at it from that angle, then it's actually the same yeah. limitation, if you want to call it a limitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th yeah. I think that's a very good example. I think I used a more generic example where I was saying, well, I mean, you've got to understand the idea of if we define omnipotence as the ability to, um, you know, the, the ability to sort of to, you know, to act in any logically possible manner, um, it's just a logical impossibility. So for me, it just, it's the same thing as a yeah. you know, asking the father to create a married bachelor or the son, you just can't do right. it because by definition, the terms don't make sense. And so for me, I was just like, you wouldn't use this. I mean, if you're speaking to an atheist, an atheist, brought up this example of, let's say, you know, the the stone paradox or the paradox of the stone, you would bring up yeah. this example. So well, you have to understand the idea of what omnipotence is. It's exactly the same in this scenario. Yeah. I think that example that you brought up, uh, Dr. I think it would have actually been more useful to say, actually, well, actually the father can't even do, do this action himself. And I think right. that, would have been, that would have been very useful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it all, it all for me, it all boils down to, at least in my understanding, it all boils down to, do they have the same divine nature? And if the answer is yes, and if your yeah. if your system, if your definitions and your system preserves that, then it doesn't matter if you have a, like a hypostatic difference or, you know, mm -hmm. that that's just part and parcel with what Trinitarianism is. But I wanted to touch on this point of omnipotence because you guys covered some points I already made. But um, this is kind of a side point mm -hmm. is... Hijab's explaining the uh, the view of attributes in Islam. I thought I would just play it because it's. Can you he hear is that? the all powerful one, therefore we can create. Or God is the creator, therefore creation. Right? Are you with me? Therefore is the creator, therefore creation is a necessary outgrowth, if you like, or it's uh, it's, it's a consequence of his creative capacity. See that that just sounds like the origin origin is problematic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Necessary. If you're going to say creation is necessary, yeah, I don't think he meant to say that because I, I don't think traditional Muslim theology holds that creation is necessary. Yeah, that's fair. Is, is yeah. So yeah. that I caught that, and I was like, but um, I don't think I heard that point actually. I think I would have, I would have actually said that you, you know, said something that's very dangerous. I <laughs> you wouldn't want to hold to that view. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'll think of my next point or something, but I just I didn't hear that point. Um, but I think yeah, that that is very very problematic, and I think other Muslim debaters would probably say no, you shouldn't have said that. Yeah, you shouldn't have said that. But yeah. I think I think the Islamic account of attributes does does necessitate that because okay. the because the attribute of creator is eternal, and then even the mm -hmm. active participle is eternal. So then you have a. <laughs> an active creator that's eternal <laughs> so for me it, it boils down that way anyway uh, which mm -hmm. is a critique we make a lot in the in the discord 
Yeah. But um, yeah, it's kind of a side point. Um, mm -hmm. So back to the omnipotence thing. So I'm going to go to 1905 because I do have a question for both uh, for both of you. So about this. My question. Fine. If there's an attribute of distinction yes. which allows the father, or which implies that the father can do and be something more than more than plus than the son, then that would mean that there's a hierarchy in ability. No, it doesn't. Yeah, remember well, I'm, well, I'm going to have to leave it to you to think second, about that. When we are talking about ability, I said this to you before, man, and I was saying to you, you're referring to the property of omnipotence. They each share the property of omnipotence. The range of omnipotence for the Father, Son, and the Spirit might be different, given the generative properties. Because the Son, it's a logically impossible action for the Son to bring about the Father, because by definition, the Father yeah, yeah. cannot be brought about. And that's the problem. The same way, no, it's not. The same way that the, the Son or any divine person bringing about a squared circle, bring about yeah, a marriage. Yeah. I understand your point. Because by I, definition, it's an impossible action. I get your point. I know we talked about this a bit, but I was just wondering what um, your take, Bo, would be on the on the because uh, this was because I hadn't heard this yet, and so I was hearing for Josh, and it sounds really good on the face of it. Um, I was just wondering what your thought would be about lumping the idioma in with the attribute of omnipotence. What do you think of that? Uh, I mean, like, are the is is the is it a power or is it a yeah. You know. Well, I mean, you, you know, presumably you want to say all three divine persons are omnipotent. So um, I, I guess the way I would. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, there's different ways to try to define omnipotence. Right. Um, and Josh was talking about this a second ago, the, the paradox of the stone. Right. Most philosophers of religion, I think, have pretty much given up on um, trying to define omnipotence in terms of logically possible kinds of actions that you can perform. So one, one way to think about omnipotence is give me any type of action and God can do that sort of thing, right? If it's logically possible. A totally different way of thinking about omnipotence is give me any logically possible state of affairs and God can make that state of affairs obtain. Maybe with some qualifications, maybe there's certain ones that he can't. Or whatever. But anyway, um, most people are, I think, are going to say if you if you try to think of omnipotence in terms of kinds of actions that you can perform, you're always going to get the stone paradox, which is can God create a stone so big that he can't lift it, right? Because that it's clearly possible for me to make something that's so big I can't lift it, right? Um, so there, there's a, or, or think about much more mundane examples like can God roll over in bed or like scratch his ear or can God lie or sin or whatever, right? There's all sorts of things that I can do that God can't do. There are just kinds of actions that, that God can't do. So most, I, I think that, that most philosopher religions just think that's not going to, there's, there's no way to kind of tweak that to make it work. But if you think about it in terms of logically possible states of affairs, um, then you might say, yeah, maybe with certain restrictions so that we, maybe because of free will or whatever, but with certain kinds of restrictions, you might be able to say, well, God can can bring about whatever logically possible states of affairs he wants. Um, but if that's the way that you define omnipotence, right, then I don't think that you get this kind of problem that, that he's trying to bring up. So, um, yeah, the, the father can bring about or can be the cause of the state of affairs, uh, there being a second divine person, right? Um, the son can't bring about the state of affairs of there being a first divine person because that person already exists, right? And I mean, God, the father can't bring about the existence of there being just, you know, there being just one divine person, the first divine person, because he's already there. <laughs> right. So, I mean, there's no, I mean, right. Um, and no one really can bring about a state of affairs uh, of there being a divine person that no one brings about, right? Because that, that would just be a contradiction.
So I, th I think a lot, of, and I hear this kind of objection uh, when you talk about the, the divine processions and things, but I think, I think it all sort of hinges on how, which of those roots you take in thinking about omnipotence. And I think the, you, there's a, you have to go the action type route to make this objection work. But I think that if you go that route, you just have problems with omnipotence anyway. Like you're just going to get paradoxes with, with omnipotence in general. If you go the other route, you don't get paradoxes with omnipotence necessarily, but you also don't get this objection, I don't think. Hope that made sense. I don't know if, that, if you any, any any comments, Josh? Yeah, no, no. I think that's very useful. Just um, making that distinction, um, which is sort of prevalent now in the literature. Um, but again, I, I mean, just sort of rooting in the debate. I think. Uh, I think even bringing up the term "states of affairs," I think that would just be classed even as like either not understood or just understood to be an action. And so we'll just collapse into the first yeah. approach. I think, I think, if I'm honest, yeah, again, the terms need to be defined. We need to understand at the beginning what this is, what is a state of affairs, what is an action, why does this approach not lead to this sort of issue that he he's trying to to, to sort of bring up. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's actually useful if you, if you just can have the opportunity to define those terms and he's willing to, to go with you in that sort of definition. Um, which I actually believe they probably wouldn't. <laughs> but yeah, I think it is useful just focusing on sort of the distinction between states for affairs and actions and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Cool. Um, where do I want to go? Because we're covering stuff for my points that are later. So um, yeah. let's go to this bit. It makes it clear that the Father is God, the Son is God, yes. and that the Holy Spirit well, what is, is God. Good. Now, how they remember what I said at the beginning? God is an ambiguous term. It can be used. It wasn't for it wasn't for the guys that were writing no, that creed. It can be used in a nominal sense as a name. It can be used in a predicative sense as a predicate. And how how are you sure? So, how are you sure that the writers of the Constantinople Constantinopolitan Creed, the three eighty one? Meant it in a predicate sense. Because I've studied the works. Of the That's not a good enough answer. Once if you study the works, yeah. First. yeah. Let me finish my answer. Yeah. How you know what the text of the words meant yeah. was that you read the influential theologians who formulated the We talked about Gre and Nizantius the and uh, Gregory of Basil. Uh, sorry, sorry, Gregory of Nyssa and Basil the, Basil the Great. Yeah. But we've also said that they made it very clear, especially in light of the threat of the tropicy that came before, right? No, 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 no. no please, please, please. No, no, allow, no, no, me, no. allow me, allow me, allow me, allow me. The whole, tro the, the idea of the tropicy. I'm sure you're aware of this, right? The tropicy negated the divinity of the Holy Spirit, okay? And they claimed that the Holy Spirit was a creature. That's what they claimed. And so, in response, the, the response, if you look at the polemical works of the early church fathers in the fourth century, is categorical. In that, from who? Most categorical from Augustine. Most categorical from Augustine. Can I, can I just but, 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 so they agreed that the son was homoousios with the father. Yeah. And they did not agree that the spirit was homoousios with yeah. the other two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they were going against it. Basil, funny enough, never actually ever referred to the Holy Spirit as God. Because he held to the. I haven't seen all of his works. So I'm telling you, Basil yeah. never did it. Okay. Go and look it up. But Gregory of is this. Yeah. Basil was very, very hesitant to do it because of the view I'm talking about, because of the monarchy of the Father. Because yeah. he said, if we use the word God for the Holy Spirit, it's going to negate the monarchy that the Father is the one God. So he. Yeah, I mean, that's very clear in the footnotes, though, isn't it? Of all the Basil uh, works that he never calls the Spirit Theos. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually something that, that really caused problems between Gregory Nazianzen and Basil, because Nazianzen really wanted him to just be make it explicit, and Basil would be like, "Yeah, but that's what I believe." But like, but say it out loud, say it. Explicit. But yeah, I think it was just you know Basil just for political sort of reasons, like he just didn't want to open that can of worms and cause a big controversy. So he was like, "But but it is clear. I mean, he does make it." clear enough that he thinks that the Holy Spirit has the same usia, the same nature 
you know, as the father and the son, but yeah, he didn't want to use the word God for him. Yeah. Anything you want to say, Josh? Yeah, no, no. So, yeah, no, I think um, what I was trying to do with that specific point, I think from before was just trying to say, I think at the beginning of the, the clip is we need to understand what we, what we mean when we're using the word God, because I think he just took a univocal view to God and just said, well, God just means this. And so, well, if the Holy Spirit is referred to as God, that's what they must be meaning by it. And I was just trying to say that there, there's different ways and different understandings of, and I think this, I bring this up a lot in my thesis where there are different ways that you can use the word God, it's ambiguous. And so one way, and one very, the, the primary way is when it's used in reference to the Father in this sort of, where it's sort of, you know, the Father's actually numerically identical to God and it's used sort of as a name for him. Um, but that, that doesn't negate from the, the, the Son and the Spirit being God, but you need to understand what they're meaning by the word God. And I was saying, in a way, it's more like a predicative sense. It's just referring to them having the same divine nature as the Father. Right. Um, and that's why. Um, and I think, I don't know if it's this point, but then I, I sort of read from Nazianzus and I say, where he says, you know, when they're, when they're together, um, when, when, sorry, when they're alone, uh, the Son and the Spirit, um, I think he speaks about the Son, they're refer he's referred to as God, but when he's with the Father, right. um, because of the monarchy, he's, the, 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 he's referred to as Lord. And I think that was sort of emphasizing. And then he says, one, yeah, he says one because of the monarchy, one because of the nature. Um, and so there's that sort of distinction now trying to say, you look, even Nazianzus, who was very influential of that period, um, he had this sort of distinction when we're using the word God. And it's very important that you understand that. But I think he just wanted to, again, take this broad brush approach and say, God just you, yeah. is used in this one way. I've, I've noticed that, uh, and I, this might address some of the comments on the chat too, for us up watching them but they're from earlier, but. People, I think, for I don't know why, but they can't get their head around the idea that the word God can be used in different senses, mm. um, and so then and then they flip out because if you say that Jesus, uh, you know, isn't God or something, but you're just saying he's not the Father, <laughs> like yeah. he's, not, he's yeah. not his own Father. But if you said that he was his the Father, then you that would be modalism, right? Like no one really is is. Uh, yeah. Uh, should be affirming affirming that, but there's a different sense of the term God, and then the the question is, uh, yeah, is sort of just who who do you, when you when you're just kind of talking about capital G God, and especially in the New Testament and in the the pre Nicene fathers, and really up into the fourth century and and beyond, like what does that refer to if you're using it as a name? if we're using it as a name, then it just refers to the father. But if we're using it as a, almost like an adjective, but I mean, it's a, it's a description. That's a quality. It can be predicated of the father and the son and the Holy spirit. Um, they all have that nature. But when we're talking about the one God as an individual, we're talking about the father, which yeah. you were saying like, that's, that's the yeah, exactly. creed, right? That's the, yeah, exactly. And, um, I think, yeah, exactly what you were saying before. Um, when you say, and I think he was trying to uh, later on corner me on this bit, I think to get a sound bite saying, oh, so Jesus is not God then. Yeah, think, yeah that's what they yeah, were. It's, it's just not under, they, they just assume when you say you're using the word God, I think they take the view that it's just referring to a divine person. So you're saying, well, Jesus is not divine then. Jesus, you know, doesn't have, you know, the, the, the properties or whatever that the father has. And so he's, he's not co-equal in a sense. And again, I think yeah. for me, what I'm really trying to hammer on is just there is this distinction. And I think it's so helpful when you know that actually God can be used in different ways in different senses. And, mm -hmm. and it, it, again, like you were saying, there's scriptural and a historically grounded view, um, mm -hmm. which I think is just very important to make. And then you don't trip yourself up um, because, yeah, Jesus is not God in a certain sense when we're using it in that specific way. I think yeah. it's very important. He understood that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that that doesn't mean Jesus is not God in the sense of, you know, yeah. having the divine nature or something like that, which they, they want it to be Arianism, but it's just you, yeah. you have to switch to a different definition of God to, to yeah. get that, get yeah. that yeah. result. Yeah. But, um, I was going to say uh, kind of along the, the same line. So, yeah, Gregory Nazianzen has the oration where he says, um, 
we refer to Christ as God when he's mentioned separately, but then when he's mentioned together with the Father, we refer to him as Lord, not God, because of the monarchy. Um, and I was get you mentioned way way earlier uh, something about God, whether God is tripersonal, and I, I was going to say it's fun. It's a funny, interesting factoid. There's only one time that Gregory Nazianzen ever actually uses the word tripersonal or like tree. It's like triprosopone, you know, in, in Greek. Um, and he's just makes fun of it. He says like, what are you saying? You know, like, are you saying it's like a, a man with three faces? I think I actually got it up here. It says, what do you mean who assert the three persons? Do you imagine a single compound sort of being with three faces? Perish the thought. So, you know, he's imagining an objector saying, like, try, try personal. You mean like a guy with three heads? And he's like, no. Like, like William Lane Craig's Cerberus. And I know, that's the funny him. thing. That's exactly William <laughs> Lane Craig's view. And, and Gregory Nazianz is like, no, that's stupid. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of funny. And that's literally the only time he uses the word try personal, yeah. Yeah. try personal being. So it's yeah. funny to that people take that to be like a sign of orthodoxy or something. When you you go back to the sources and it's like, well, that's not what. Yeah. Gregor Nazianzen. Uh, yeah. And that, that is scary. But it's scary that it's not just. If I'm honest, I don't fault the Muslims. If I'm honest, a lot, it's a oh, lot sure. of Muslims who are furthering views like that, which can be very confusing. And so, for me, I think it's just just educating it and saying, actually, what did these individuals who were living in this specific time hold to? They would have actually said, this is completely crazy and, and laugh at it, like you were saying. Um, but yeah, that's actually interesting that he took it as a joke. Yeah. Um, one thing, I, I, I'd like to know what Craig's view on that would be. Like yeah, I know, yeah, we should send that. No, yeah. one thing I was going to say too, though, um, that would be useful when you're talking to Muslims, I don't know if you ever read the paper that I, that I wrote on the monarchy the father and yes, but you know uh, i mentioned in in there that uh the way that the quran itself actually describes the trinity is actually the monarchical sort of view that i'm talking about so it actually says it describes the the trinity as the view that god is one of three mm. god is one third of the trinity or one yeah. out of three or whatever um yeah. So the interesting thing is, I mean, if if Muslims want to say like, no, that, you know, you're an Aryan or something, you know, because or it's this isn't the you know, this isn't really the doctrine of the Trinity unless they're all co-equal. And the one God is a triune, you know, tri-personal being or whatever, um, then they're actually contradicting the Quran. Right. So like if they want to say that the Quran is correct, then they'd have to say that the monarchical view of the Trinity is the doctrine of the Trinity because that's how the Quran describes it. Yeah, yeah which yeah. probably just means that Muhammad. Can't, I mean, Western scholars routinely just say like, "Oh, this means you know Muhammad was just some illiterate, you know, stupid guy didn't know what he was talking about, didn't understand the Trinity." But probably what happened is just that's the that was the view of the people around the Middle East at that time that he actually came into contact with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's actually very very useful because I think. If, yeah, if that's brought up, that you, yeah. you'll really have to question it. You won't, you can't, yeah, if you actually show it, you can source it. And then yeah, just, yeah. Oh, it, it led to this view even by the Quran. I would actually like to see his face for that, uh, what he'll actually say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, the position that you're trying you're trying to do. Um, but that is very interesting. I, I actually loved your paper. That, that paper is very, very helpful. Um, oh, good, yeah. Yeah, specifically... I think I brought up this reference that the one that opened up my eyes was that reference from is it Gregory of Nyssa, um, mm -hmm. where he says the one you know the God over all, and he basically, yeah. and I think you then sort of um, elucidate that passage and say you know it's an individuation. God is actually individuated as the Father, um, yeah, the other way around, which is actually very very interesting. Yeah, um, there's just uh, Andrew Redagalis just came out with his paper responding to Dale Tuggy in the, in the Theologica issue I'm editing. And he kind of said like that wasn't really decisive evidence or whatever he thought, because um, Gregory sometimes applies God overall to Christ too. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but the thing that about it is that it's not just the application of that phrase to the father in particular, but it's, 
if you think about the logic of his argument, right? Like he's saying that God is individuated by the property of being a father. So he can't just mean like the father's, the father is being individuated by having the property being the father. Cause that's just kind of circular. Like, uh, and in, in all, in the other two cases, he's giving non circular ways of, of individuating them. And if you, you kind of think it through. Yeah, it does look like he just is really saying the first person of the Trinity is God. And what makes him unique is the fact that he's a father. Yeah. 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 And I don't see any way to get around. There's other yeah. stuff too. I mean, the, in the contra eunomius, I mean, there's a number of places where he just kind of says like, Hey, if you're saying that the one God is the father, then fine. Like we're because you have to keep in mind what what really the way the argument starts out, and maybe this will clear some things up too for people that are kind of getting in halfway through or whatever. But the way that the the Arian controversy really starts out, if you go all the way back to the deposition of Arius, uh, what what they actually say is the number one heresy they list is that God was not always a father. Like that's that's what they say. Arius is like number one heresy was is that he his view leads to this conclusion that God was not always the father. So it's not that, you know, Arius thinks God is the father and everybody else thinks God's the whole Trinity altogether. It's Arius thinks God at one point in time was not the father. He was not a father. Yeah. And the Orthodox are saying, no, he eternally, which then if you understand that, okay, so God is essentially the father, then he always has a son. And so then that means this, that just entails that the son is co-eternal with him and yeah. a son has the same nature as his father. So it entails that the son is eternal and has the same divine nature as the father. And that was what they were originally arguing about it's not it's it isn't until augustine and i think even later than augustine that people start kind of thinking about it in a in terms of the yeah. trinity being god and i think you bring that up also in your paper with eunomius um where there's sort of a shared agreement about the monarchy so it's not even like they're yeah debating yeah. about the monarchy it's a shared agreement but it's that idea about um, the co-relativity of the father and the son and the essentiality of that. And I think that's very, very important to bring out that actually this is not even a debated point. It's about yeah. this sort of essential fatherhood and things like that. And I think it's 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 very important for them to yeah to grapple with that as well. Yeah. 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 So here's this next bit. Um this is uh this is uh you'll like this bit. No, no, wait. So, okay, fine. I'm, I don't want to argue with you. You know why? Because what you're basically saying is Jesus is not God. No, I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying to you is, no, Mohammed, you can't then just leave it on that. No, I, I, I agree. To, no, Mohammed, <laughs> that can't be the substance of the argument at the end. No, no, no that's Mohammed, what you said. What do you mean? You missed no, I haven't. I've understood all of it. Yeah, I've, I've understood fully wait, what you said. Okay, tell me what I said. You said. No. That was a yeah. that was a good bit, wasn't it? Yeah, because that what I felt he was gonna do was um he was just gonna cut out most of the debate. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and say, Oh Jesus is not God without making those conceptual distinctions, which are really, yeah. really important. Um and that's what I was a little bit worried about. So I was like, please, you need to emphasize, yeah, when I'm saying Jesus is not God, like we were saying before, it's in a certain sense, but he is God in another sense. Um, which he did say he understood, but then was going against it again which I didn't really grasp why. Um, yeah, but that's how they debate. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there's just such a tendency in the culture to harp on like the sentence, Jesus is God. Uh, and, and then people can't figure out that that's what that means is that Jesus has the divine nature, that he's divine with the same nature as god the father so then if you say well look there's you might be using the word god in the sense that it just means the father you might be using the word god in the sense that it means has the divine nature and so yeah he's not the father and then people just but they hear the turn the the words jesus isn't god and they kind of flip out like they can't they can't figure out the distinction that's going on yeah um, yeah i don't know i mean I, it's a, it's a historic like sore spot isn't it it's kind of like uh like um, 
like a wound that's been scratched so often since mm. since the early church started so yeah. it's that's probably why there's such a strong reaction to that but yeah um one thing verbal is, and is, substantive disagreement. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to mention that, but it's just uh, it it does seem like this is another issue of kind of verbal versus substantive agreement or disagreement, or whatever. Um, so yeah, he he's happy if he can just verbally get the statement that Jesus is not God, but in that context, it just means Jesus is not the Father, and that's just denying modalism. I mean, yeah. it's not. Or Jesus yeah. is not the first principle or arche yeah. or arce. Yeah. Yeah. Straight, straight in one part of the debate, he actually said I was a modalist, which is very weird. If you, I think it was at the beginning of the thing. He said that's modalism. Yeah. <laughs> well, because the, it's the same thing that happened actually with the Cappadocians. Like they would simultaneously be accused of like being modalists and being tritheists. It's like, how does that make any sense? Modalist, like, coordinationist, tritheist. Yeah, they, I guess they just can't yeah. kind of figure out that distinction. But. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then a lot of it until from that bit onto here is kind of just reifying stuff we've already talked about or some point that's already been made. So but this, is a, this is an interesting point uh, we could address. View on it, then did his research, looked into his study, okay. then changed his view. No, no, let, me, let me tell you why. Let me show you. What you're saying is salvation requires three years with Swinburne. No, 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 please, 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 please. When did I bring you salvation? Okay, put salvation to the side. Does the truth go to you? Okay. Bring it. You bring okay, it up, okay, put it to no, the side. Let me, let me rewind for a second, then I'll tell you why salvation is important. Is the Trinity important for? Is the Trinity important for sal? Has it got a salvific um, function? Is it, is it part of the salvific package in Christianity? I would say to you, what is part of the salvific package is the divinity of the person. Yeah. The okay. So then, hold on. So, so I can tell you. So, so, but you're distinguishing between the godness and the divinity, no, right? Man, let me tell you. Okay, the argument that they were having in the fourth century was surrounding the issue of theosis. Mm. Do you need a PhD to get saved? <laughs> Clearly, I don't, I don't know where that came from. I, like, I just, uh, I don't know. I don't, well, here, let me see, let me know, see if I, I can charitably interpret. He's saying that the Trinity is a necessary dogma for salvation, so you need to get that right. You need to believe in that correctly. But if you need to read these Cappadocian fathers and all that stuff and not just have a generic popular understanding like the the egalitarian view uh then uh, if you don't believe in the monarchia then aren't you aren't, aren't, aren't you then kind of disqualified from correctly having the correct belief and then being having your salvation at risk that's kind of the the charitable yeah, think, interpretation yeah um, with me, I think, I, if I'm honest, it's, it's, it is a good question in that, because then he he would say to me, well, I think he was trying to say, I don't know if you brought this up or this was something in my mind. I mean, he would say, well, the Trinity is central to Christian belief. Um, so it's not like a peripheral view in Christianity. It's, it's, it's central. Mm -hmm. And so if you're touting this sort of for him, new view, and then you're basically saying that all the other Christians understand it completely wrong, then what does what implications are there for salvation? Um, what I what I mean it is a good question. What I was trying to, and I think Dr. Bradley, you can sort of clarify this a lot more, but I was trying to focus more on I think the debate was not the idea of just being able to conceptualize the Trinity, but the importance of safeguarding the divinity of Christ and the implications that has for um, our, our atoning salvation. So I, I was trying to bring out, I don't think I went in, into good um, depth with it, but the idea of theosis, and I think, if I'm honest, this was more Athanasius's idea, but the idea that we need to safeguard this idea of the divinity of Christ, that has more implications for our salvation than being able to conceptualize yeah. divinity and being able to you know understand it fully. I, that, that, I mean, I was trying to go down that path. I don't know if you can mm. maybe come back to me or just maybe have a different view on it. I I think I, I hear these sorts of things a lot. And I, 
I think people don't quite understand the concept of heresy. So they think of it as like, you need to actually fully understand and affirm like, you know, John of Damascus's exact exposition of the Orthodox Fifth. You know, like you've got to be able to go through all that. There's going to be a exam when you get to heaven. You know, get out your Scantron sheets and yeah. try, you know. And in reality, of course, the so you know the idea of a heresy. It's not that you need to understand and affirm everything. It's that you need to not deny it, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, you you can you can perfectly well just say, you know what, I don't really understand all this stuff, but I, I just have faith in it. And I, you know, like, I mean, a, a completely uneducated person could, you know, can be, can be a good Christian. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, it, you know, Catholics and Orthodox, like we baptize infants, they're not cognitively even able to comprehend any of this stuff. And we're probably not really able to comprehend Mo you know, any, anything like to the degree we think we can. So it, yeah. the, the problem with heresy is that it's a problem of pride, right? It's a problem of thinking that you understand. It's not that, oh, I don't understand it. It's you think that you understand it so well that you know that everybody else is wrong about it and they need to, you know what I mean? I mean, that's what someone like Arius did is like he was told by his bishop stop preaching such and such because that's not right. And he was so sure that he was right that he said, I'm just going to keep preaching this anyway. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, a council comes together and like the vast majority of his fellow priests and bishops are like, no, yeah, this is, this is wrong. You need to stop preaching. This. And he's like, no, screw you guys. I'm just going to go to, you know, go to Palestine and find someone else to so like that's heresy is the pride of thinking that you understand it so well that you know everybody else is wrong and you're the only one who's right. Yeah. Uh, if you just don't understand something, that's not heresy. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that's very, very important. Um, yeah, exactly your point you were saying about rejecting a belief and understanding yeah. it. And it's I like willfully rejecting something yeah. that the church has taught. And yeah. Yeah. And then actually understanding it. Because I think that's what he was saying. He was linking more salvation to the understanding process. Than yeah, and that's just like, that's not a... Well, that's, is, uh, that's, that's uh, very Islamic, actually. Mm. Like uh, oh, some yeah. Islamic sources say that, you know, it's superior to read and understand your Aqidah yeah. than it is to pray. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, like the no, I think I was watching listening to Asra Rashid, and he said the number one most important thing a Muslim should be able to do is prove the existence of God. Oh really? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Like that's the number one. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's at least so from well. what I understood, yeah. yeah. Um, but the other thing I'd say is always, I think even this issue of verbal and substantive disagreement comes in here because, so like, if you deny eternal generation, I think that's a huge problem. But I think most. So it, it will come down to whether you use whether you are exclusivist about using this the, the the term one God for the Father or for the Trinity basically is what it will come down to, seems to me. But as long as you affirm eternal generation, spiration, um, the Father as sole cause, uh, and the sharing of the divine nature, then you wouldn't even be a heretic by our standards. Even, I don't think, even if you just chose, if you just decided you wanted to not follow this route of saying the one God is the Father. Because Augustine yeah. believed that, and he was an heir. Well, he, well I don't even know if you could later, even say he was an heir on this. But Yeah, there, there's, there's plenty of later Orthodox saints, too, who will say that the one God is the Trinity. Hmm. So there's, no, you know, like I, I pointed this out in my, in my, the, the reason that I made a big deal out of this is, is because Dale Tuggy has a particular argument that basically says um, that just like by definition, the doctrine of the Trinity says that the one God is the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And that's not how the New Testament says things. And he doesn't really get that, or I don't know, whatever, if he understands it or not. But anyway, he doesn't think about the there might be a distinction in, in the meaning there, right? It might be a shift in the, the meaning of the term. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of make the point like, 
No, you can ha you can formulate the doctrine of the Trinity a perfectly orthodox way by saying there's one God, the Father. I mean, that's the way the Nicene Creed does it. Right? There's just there's the one God's the Father, just like the Bible has. And then as long as you affirm that the Son is exactly the same as the Father, right? has the exact same divine nature, is only distinct, um, o only distinguished by the the relation of begetting and uh, being begotten, like. That's a perfectly orthodox way to formulate things. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it's that you can't possibly um, use the word God in a different sense and then say that, OK, the one God is the Trinity, because um, you do get that. I mean, I think you it's not just that you, you get that in Augustine, but you you get that in people like Gregory Palamas and some other later. Um, I just think that if you look at the Eastern tradition, it's clear that the one God being the father, like lingers on a lot longer and is still operative. Like that was operative in the great schism, right? The, the problem with the filioque was supposed to be like, well, this causes problems for the monarchy of the father. I mean, whether it does or not, but that, that, that was Photius's argument was then you have two gods because you've got two, two our key, right? Um, and that you even get that later, I mean, up into the 1200s and everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think there it, it's. I mean, you know, I, I guess I, I guess I sort of agree with what the way Swinburne <laughs> responded to my email is just like, yeah, it depends on what you mean by the word God. Like if you want to use the word God in a different sense, but it's just you have to acknowledge that you're using the word God in a different sense from how it's used in the Bible and, and the early church fathers. But yeah. I think yeah. saying the one God is the Trinity works um, or the Trinity is the one God with the energies as well. Like that it works perfectly well. As, right. you know. Yeah. 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 If you're talking about uh, like, I would say, yeah, there's the, the creator of heaven and earth. I mean, ultimately in some sense, that's just the Trinity. Like in any of the energies, odd extra are one. So the creator, the redeemer, I mean, I'm fine with saying all of that is, and I mean, in fact, in, in that sense, I'm fine with saying the Trinity is the, the one God, if that's just what you mean is that it's the one doer of a certain kind of activity. I mean, that's really, that's what my dissertation was mostly about. But, but I think if you're using it as a name for an individual, for a person, which is how people in the modern context want to do it, then well, it's clear in that sense then it refers to the father yeah. yeah i sort of similar to my thesis I, I don't know if it's sort of an artificial distinction that i made that i i don't know if i hold to now but it was i was saying sort of the three senses are a nominal sense so a name for a person the father mm -hmm. and then you have the predicative sense and then i i said for the trinity you're you, not using it as a name or a predicate but using it as a title for yeah this community and so how we can hold it together saying mm. yeah we're saying there is only one god when we're using it as a name for the father there's one god when we're using it in reference as a predicate to for the the persons with the divine nature uh, yeah. but then also you can hold to it being the trinity but we're not saying the trinity's god as a name but we're giving it a title um for the community mm. that they they make up and then i was saying i think i used the term sort of theistic pluralism that you can just you can be a pluralist when when it comes to the word God and and say yeah maybe some people are using it in reference to the Trinity but they're not contradicting the earlier usage of it as a name for the Father because it's using the title for the Trinity or sorry the title for the community and then it's used in a different way I don't know if I hold to that as a title now but I would I was just saying there's from in my mind there's a way to different. bring it together that we're not actually contradicting. Oh, well, it, it, it could work if you consider energies to be titles, okay. like king or creator, or couldn't oh, you? Right. Yeah, yeah, couldn't yeah. you? Yeah. So you could cash it out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking about it. But then there's also the, what was the other? Yeah, there was the energy sense. And, and then we also had uh, the image sense, which was the yeah, other good yeah, one. Yeah. So there's, th there is a sense, I think, in which you can just say that Christ is capital G God, which is the the fact that he functions as a representation of the father. So like, if I have a picture of my wife, I can just point to the photograph and say, hey, this is my wife. Mm -hmm. Right. But of course, it's not 
<laughs> I mean, you know, if someone was like, wait, that's numerically, this photograph is numerically identical to your wife. Like you married a photograph like no, but I can, I can say that. So, I mean, I think you can even correctly say Jesus is God. Um, you, you know, you can't maybe say it like in predicate logic or something where you've got the equal sign, but, but I mean, you, we do do that, right? We, we say, uh, we point to a representation and we, uh, we speak as though it is the thing that it represents. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's in the, that's for yeah. me, that's been the most explicit in Basil's homily against the yeah, Sabellian. Basil uses that a lot, like that, that we don't, yeah. uh, we don't say that there's two, like we say that there's a king and then there's the image of the king, which we refer to it as the king, but we wouldn't say that there's two kings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what's the next one here? Um, yeah, so this is an interesting, uh, well, it's, well, I guess it's kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of, per I'd say it's pertinent. There is a cutoff sometimes with the lay level understanding of something and the scholarly level. The scholarly position on this, patristic scholarship, yeah. is in support of what I'm saying. That's your, okay? that's your view. Go and look it up. Right? Well, it, I have looked it up. It's not me. It it's, uh, Tell me no, the scholarship. Tell fine. The scholarship. I've told you before. Look at us. I've named the scholars, them. The scholars. The scholars. Yes. Okay, Jane D. Kelly. Sorry. When he when he was, what are you laughing? At? Early Christian doctrine. Yeah. When was that written? I don't know, but you said what are you talking about? Are you, are you talking about Patricia Scholars? No, when was J and D Kelly's work? I don't know. Then why are you bringing it up? So do I have to know the year when his book was published? There's two the there's most, two books no, that's written, by the way. One second, one second, one second. Early the church most, doctrines no, and then uh, creeds as well. No, no doctrines, creeds. Mammon, you need to be educated on this issue. I don't know when he wrote it. You need to be educated. Maybe it was in the nineties. No, he wrote in the sixties. I don't know. The most important listen, the most important period for patristic scholarship at the yeah. moment started in the early 21st century with the work of Lewis Ayers called Nicaea and its legacy. Fine, I'll read it. Okay, and Michael- I haven't read this. One second. Michael, uh, uh, Michelle Barnes as well, who was working- Yeah, Michael Rene Barnes yeah. or- Yeah, no, um, I could, I could, let me, I want to say, I could just see the suffering in your face in this bit because you're like, you're like, dude, I I literally, I changed my view because I went and read yeah. all this stuff. <laughs> like, I'm not just inventing it and then just yeah. holding these scholars over next to me to support my position. Like, no, I, I read this, I read all this and then I changed my mind because of it. <laughs> and yeah. you're just, you're just like suffering. You're like... <laughs> yeah. One thing I would, I, I'm, about the scholarly position, I... I think I was a bit more, I should have been a bit more nuanced to what I was saying. So, I mean, they're, they're obviously, I don't know if Lewis Ayers, funny enough, Dr. Brandt, this would be interesting for you to, I don't know if Lewis Ayers holds to the monarchy. Because I, I remember there was, um, in I think it was a symposium on his book where there was like a, a, a John Bear repl replied to him or something or his book. And mm -hmm. he was trying to speak about the monarchy and saying how he doesn't emphasize it in Nicaea and its legacy. Um, I don't know if Lucer's position on the monarchy is quite clear. Um, but I mean, what I was trying to emphasize was, I mean, if you look at the scholarship on this issue, this is a, this is a relevant issue at the moment. And you can't just be quoting works from like 50 years ago with, where there's been sort of this revisionist sort of view of even Trinitarianism in general um, from these later works. And you're not even grappling with them. And then you're saying, that I'm completely wrong. I'll be fair, it'll be fine if he said, Oh, I don't know. It's an interesting view, but I don't know what you know what the position on it. But he's literally saying, I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. go and look at the scholarship on the issue and then you know have that sort of formulate your opinion based on that. Um yeah. I um I guess I shouldn't say like off the top of my head, but I, I feel like I'm almost sure I've read Lewis Ayers say that not that he maybe was big on the monarchy of the father, but he just he affirmed that like that Augustine believed in the monarchy of the father. Yeah, I do remember seeing that in um, I think it was, it was Augustine in the Trinity or something. Yeah, there was, a, there, was a, there was quite yeah. When I was doing my research for my thesis, I think that popped up a lot. He was yeah. Uh, yeah there's actually I think a very good quote on that. He was actually arguing that it's central to yeah um, his read. But what I, I would yeah, what I would be interested in, because I think going back to your paper, um, where you sort of distinguish between the, the strong and weak monarchy view, mm -hmm. uh, 
I, I, I'll be interesting if you were saying Augustine was holding to the, the strong monarchy view or he was holding oh. the weak he's using more weak sense. Well, I mean, I think everybody believed in the weak sense yeah. of monarchy. Um, I mean, all, Thomas Aquinas, I think, believes in the weak monarchy, the father. Yeah. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not enough of a, I mean, I don't claim to be an Augustine scholar at all, but as far as I can see, it seems like it's just kind of within the De Trinitate. He takes a very different approach from what he takes like everywhere outside of the De Trinitate. So like in the De Trinitate, the Trinity is the one God. Um, but like outside of the De Trinitate, it seems like the one God is the father for Augustine is still. So it's, it's very, I don't know. Yeah. Hey, Seems to me, and actually, I think I, uh, I think that it was Ayers that I was reading recently on that. That um, it's always see, I've always kind of had this suspicion that it's because of John seventeen three and the way the Homoians were using it that Augustine wants to make that move. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Ayers thinks something like that. To that that so and so within the De Trinitate, he'll say, "Yeah, the one God is the Trinity." So that when we get to you know the Father is the one true God, uh, well, you know, or to know Thee, the only true God, like that's about the Trinity somehow or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I've always felt like it's just like a move that he wants to make for that particular context. But outside of the of the De Trinitate, he never really says that the trinity is the one god yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and too, where where he talks about i mean he it's it's not just that he calls the father god but it's the logic of it only works out if he really sort of means it you know um like the 83 different questions that that work there's some places where he uses the word god and it, it i mean it's this sort of argument like God, you know, God has to have his logos. So therefore, you know, yeah. God yeah. will have a son and what if we're okay, God means the father there. So. Yeah. Yeah. This is the last um, <clears throat> clip I chose. Um, and I, 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 I wrote a blunder question mark. I thought maybe hijab made a blunder here or we'll see. And he says that it's a heresy to declare that. No, no, no to declare that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not three people, they're three persons of the one being, not in a predicative sense, in a nominal sense, in that, in that very clandered I language. That's not even what I said. They are, one second, they share the same essence, they share the same being, they are onto the You one said that there's one, one person of the Trinity. I never said there's only one Nominally, person. you said there's one person of God. Sorry, no, one person no, of God. No, 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 you don't understand Did that. Did you say that or not? It's just gone over your head. God. Why do you keep no, saying stuff like no, this? No, no, sorry, man, I'm not being rude. <laughs> that is gone, rude, bro. No, but I didn't mean to. But I'm not saying it has gone because you're quoting me and saying I've said something completely different. You said I'm, I'm God is one person. You said God is one person. One second. The Trinity, okay? If you define the Trinity, I would say there are nominally. Three. When you define the word Trinity, Trinitas, I would say there are three persons who are each defined. Okay? Then I said. When you use the word God, yeah. only God in a nominal sense is applicable to one of the persons. So if the Pope, if the Pope comes, if the Pope comes out and contrary, if the Pope comes out and that, yeah, uh, yeah, and then there's the Pope discussion, which is kind of fun, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it seemed like it did kind of go over his head, mm. but yeah, I mean, it, he was. I think he was trying to understand that I was saying now that there's only one person in the Trinity. Um, which I never said, and obviously will be very problematic. I was trying to emphasize that, no, there are three persons, three divine persons in the Trinity, but it's where we're debating. What the debate point is, is about the usage of this expression, God. Like, what does it refer to? And I was trying to say, it just solely refers to one one of those persons. Um, but then I, I don't know how, because I thought he was with me for the majority of the discussion, at least in some part. But then when I heard this, I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> when did I say there's only one person in the Trinity? Um, so that was, yeah, that was um, that was quite interesting. But then, yeah, I mean, it, it allowed me to clarify the point. I think, um, 
which, I mean, leading to the end of the discussion, it seems like he was like, okay, I have no problem with this position now. Interestingly, so I think he left with some understanding of it, which oh. I'm happy about. At that point, I was just very confused in what his conceptual understanding of this position was. Um, maybe that's why he was saying I was a heretic, uh, because he was thinking I was saying there's only one person in the Trinity. But I don't know. Yeah, and like you said, the, the Pope discussion was an interesting one. Um, yeah, it was funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought he was misrepresenting he was kind of misunderstanding papal infallibility in a sense, but yeah. yeah Cause like he couldn't like, it seems to me this would fall under like theological, like opinion in, in the Roman church. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't make sense for the Pope to come out and do like a next cathedra on that. And if he yeah. did, yeah. well, I suppose he could actually, but it would just be a bizarre, it would just be a bizarre thing to do a next cathedra on. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to, I didn't define it, but I was trying to say, I mean, let's say you're speaking to a, a Catholic on this. They would just say it's an epistemic impossibility in that, I mean, assuming infallibility, you would say, given what we know, and part of Revelation is the Nicene Creed. And the oh, correct. yeah, if you want to appeal to the Nicene Creed, then yeah. He, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it would just be in complete contradiction to the Nicene Creed. So why would he do that? Um, but I think, yeah, again, I think it's just, the understanding of, I think actually it was a very helpful person who was sitting, sorry, standing next to me, not the lady, but there was another person. Yeah, who, I saw him, yeah. Uh, yeah. This guy who's studying at Oxford, um, he's doing theology and philosophy and then he wants to go on to the PhD. Um, but he was, yeah, he was saying, I think you're getting the distinction between impeccability or or, or the idea of not being able to, you know, make any error yeah. or anything like that, the idea of infallibility. I just think he didn't understand what infallibility was for a Catholic if they're yeah. holding to that idea. Well, uh, anyway, yeah. Um, for me, the I guess one of the the questions is just like, would, would he was kind of saying, well, Augustine would consider you a heretic, which I don't mm. think is true. Because mm. when Augustine wrote his De Trinitate, it was, he made it clear it was entirely speculative and he was open to the church yeah. correcting him and yeah. then it's kind of like well and i know this this ticks off western christians but it's like who are we going to get our trinitarian theology from are we going to get it from augustine or are we going to get it from the three cappadocian fathers who were literally the who, whose whose theology the, the council man. about the trinity was based off of yeah yeah, yeah. exactly it seems pretty yeah. no-brainer to me yeah, I think, I, I don't know if I, I was trying to say, because I, I felt that it was just irrelevant, Augustine. I just don't know why Augustine was in this discussion. Like, for me, I think, again, it's because he assumed yeah. he had this high weight of authority over all Christianity and all theological sort of um, positions. And so if he, for whatever reason, didn't agree with me, then that means I'm, I'm just unorthodox. Um, yeah. But again, I don't, I'm always just going back to this. I think he just hasn't read the history on the issue. And so maybe even believe like Augustine was playing a part at Constantinople or something like that, and you know you played a part. In the <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah that's. Believe. I've always yeah. thought that. I always thought like the clearly the the big figures in the doctrine of the Trinity are like Athanasius and the Cappadocians. Like there's a you know step number one. You'd read them, and then really like if you think of it as something that. You know, like a controversy that goes from the first to the second ecumenical councils, roughly, like it kind of crystallizes by the end of the fourth century. Like Augustine is just too late, you know. Yeah. To the, yeah. I mean, like he, we we have to judge Augustine's orthodoxy in terms of exactly. what came before I mean, him. And I've yeah. I've never understood that, and I always I I met with all kind of resistance like that when I was doing my dissertation. Like, what about the Athanasian Creed, and what about Augustine? Like that's really that's already I mean, yeah, be more relevant to bring up someone like Hillary or something like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jerome or yeah. Hillary or Ambrose, even yeah, that. But I think yeah, it's just the, they well, were they were closer to a uh, an Eastern view though than uh, Augustine yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, like if we were sort of looking at these Latin sort of thinkers who would play more of a substantial role, that it will be them then. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, but what yeah, I yeah. do believe that he will, because at the end of this, you see him saying, um, 
take my number and stuff like that. I am actually going to send him this this uh, this review after. I'm going to say, have a look at this review that we just did of your stuff. Um, but I actually, I hope he goes and actually looks into the issue and sees some of the errors that he was making and the false assumptions because I think it's very important. Um, I mean, I've noticed yeah. this, what you were saying earlier with you know like J and D, D Kelly is from you know the 1960s. It actually was 1960 that it was published, and uh, I've noticed this that a lot of in a lot of these kind of debates, like people are relying on sort of older scholarship and they, they don't realize that there's been oh yeah pretty serious shifts in a mm. lot of different areas, you know, in patristics. Yeah, it's it's crazy when you realize how cutting edge patristics has gotten recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's also the other thing, like I remember when I found out through you that letter eight or well I should have I I, sh I don't know why I oh, yeah. I think I did highlight the footnote actually and then I just didn't but yeah, yeah um, this just says letter eight of Basil isn't authentic. And yeah. that's like a very egalitarian sounding yeah. letter. Yeah, um, you sent that to me and I was like, that's not actually real. But. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, ah. So then that's my thought is that a lot of the reason why there's some of this shift is because now we're finding out maybe some of these kind of more. Yeah, I, you know, example, like, platonic kind of yeah. uh, sounding church writers who had their works attributed to fathers are just being yeah. now yeah. found out to be misattributed or inauthentic yeah, yeah. Well, like, if you, okay. if you see, sorry sorry like even if you see at the corner like Arius's name plays a big part they'll always you know I mean, you see this generally anyway when we're speaking about the fourth century people always use Arius but then if you look at like the most contemporary studies on this they'll say actually Arius played such a small role yeah in the fourth century there were so many more substantial like I've never heard, never heard the name of the corner like Marcellus. Like I've never, I've never saw him actually bring up that. And he played actually quite a, um, a substantial yeah. role. You know me, so I've never heard them say that. So again, it seems like they are reading really old works. Or um, like another person who I don't know if you do you know Adnan Rashid? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bo watched us uh, him talk to. Uh... Buzzard. Buzzard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he, at the corner, I haven't spoken to him for like a year, two years, but I mean, when I was speaking to him about this, I was actually less educated at that time about this. He would be bringing up Kelly, 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 Kelly. And then. Oh, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Like, Kelly, 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 Kelly. Like, yeah. He's the main person that they were going to. So I think when they're ever doing their like uh, apologetic right. sort of training, they, 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 that, they read, um, yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think it's good. you need to be clued up on the, the latest stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's... Like, I, when I was in the middle of doing my dissertation, like, St. Basil's contra eunomius hadn't been, or I guess, well, yeah, at a certain point it was. But anyway, I mean, St. Basil's contra eunomius wasn't translated until, I, think, I want to say 2011 or something like that. I mean, you know, and it's like, and I, I was always thinking, like, this is one of the most important texts. <laughs> for the whole, for the whole, yeah, 2011 was when they came out their translation, and it's like just think about that. That for this entire time, you know, like there, like when Kelly was right, like Basil's contra eunomius hat was not in English, like up until 2011. Like that's actually really that's really it's cool. crazy. And there's there's a I mean some of uh some of John of Damascus's stuff about Islam and other things like never been translated like there's all kinds of stuff that's just like there's it's never been translated into english yeah some it's never been translated in any modern language a lot of it's has been in like french and stuff but yeah. i mean and that's crazy i mean you tell people that i mean people like i when i first got interested in patristics like i just sort of assumed that well of course all of this stuff has been translated into english and of course it's all been studied and there's probably books about it, you know, and then I realized like, oh, there's like tons of stuff that's not even translated or like there's no critical edition of it or something. Yeah, yeah. That was something that came, you you were mentioning just kind of being behind on scholarship, but like the, one of the standard English translations uh, of John of Damascus um, was done like right before they did a critical edition. So there's like parts of it that they realized later are not authentic. But like, if you get the English translation, it's got sections in it that are like, you know. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, question for Dr. Bo. I know it would lead to an infinite number of divine persons, and it isn't the case, but wouldn't the ability to generate a divine person be an outworking of omnipotence? If no, why? Um, yeah, that's actually something I'm kind of working on right now in a in a paper and a presentation that hopefully I'll do for you guys soon. But um, yeah, it, so if you think of... Um, if you think of the ability, okay, if you think of omnipotence as being able to do any kind of action that is logically possible, um, then if it's logically possible to generate a divine person, then I think you just get an infinite regress of divine persons, but you also get the stone paradox and all kinds of things. If you think of it in terms of states of affairs, then I think you just have to be precise about the states of affairs. So uh, God, the even God the Father can't cause his own existence. That's circular, right? He can't cause, and he can't cause there to be an uncaused being. That's contradictory. So no one can cause the Father's existence. Can he cause the Son to exist? Um, yeah, because that would be logically possible. It would be a logically possible state of affairs for there to be a caused divine person, right? Um, but the the second person couldn't cause the uncaused first one because that would be a contradiction, right? So then the question is, could the second person like uh, cause there to be a third person and so on and so forth? And that that's where, uh, Joshua, close your ears. Um so that's where I think the filioque is kind of a problem because, I, I, and that's one. This is one of the things that that w has always been kind of at issue. In this is if, uh, if sort of sort of the the property of generating a divine person, if that's shareable, um, then it would be logically possible. And I, I would argue then also necessary for the son to generate a divine person. And then for there to be a grandson of God and a great grandson of God and on and on and on. Um, but what what the Cappadocians want to do is say that the, the property of generating a divine person is what makes God God. Like that, it's what makes the first person the first person. In other words, that's his individual property. We would say if 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 you're talking in contemporary terms, like it's a property that God has in every possible world that the father has in every possible world and that only he has in every possible world. So that kind of guarantees your, his identity in any different possible world. So if that's the case, if fatherhood is not shareable, um, then you get a way to identify the first person. He's the father but then you don't get an infinite regress, right? You just, you get just exactly the, the father and the son um, because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be possible uh, for there to be a third divine person. That would be the, the state of affairs that the second person would be causing. But if he did that, then he would just end up being identical to the father because that property is specific to the father. Um, so you just get a contradiction that may have been too fast and confusing, but that's my answer. Oh, uh, so well, well, sorry, just uh, yeah, my, well, sorry. um, just bring in and like always go, I always go back to swim band, but would I mean, couldn't swim band secure that sort of um restriction to even if we have the filioque, we, we restrict it to two other divine persons from his a priori argument from love? Obviously, I, I, I don't think. Mm. tradition might hold to this as a as a way to do it but he would say well i mean just from the perfect goodness of the the divine persons and and the inevitability of the generation of the son by the father um because because of the need to love and or share, or share their love and then the need for them to cooperate and sharing their love with an equal um yeah. then you stop with the third one because because there's no more yeah. <laughs> have two qualitative two qualitative forms of love but then another fourth person would not add anything to the to the qualitativeness of that love and so right. be an act of will to bring about that fourth person then an act of essence and obviously right. a divine yeah. person this is from necessity and things like that um yeah so the way that he's doing it 
their um, well, the way that that sort of argument really works is kind of, um, I mean, it's almost like logic is bringing it about that there's that mm. there's more than one, right? So, in other words, it's it's more like um, it's more like you're thinking of the divine nature, and it's okay, it's instantiated once because you've got God the Father there, right? And then, but God the Father has to have someone to love and so you just there's just got to be this second divine person there um and i don't know you you'd know because you've read it more recently than me if he talks about it in kind of causal terms or or not yeah he does he does he okay. has a the father causes the son to yeah, exist of so that he can have an object of love yeah. So, the, so my question is, here, here's my, so this is an argument that I have for the Trinity, um, or at least divinity. I think you can maybe kind of expand it to Trinity, but, but, uh, so if you, if, a uh, if one of God's intrinsic qualities is necessary existence, right, then so long as it's possible for the father to generate a divine person, it's necessary, Right. So for the same sorts of reasons is like the, the modal ontological argument. Right. If there's a possible world where there's a necessary being, then that being is just necessary. So like if there's a possible world where the father generates the son, that happens in all possible worlds. Right. Mm -hmm. So then the question is like, um, he, here's here's the issue. If you say that the ability to generate a divine person is shareable if that power or whatever you want to call it is shareable, that just means there's a possible world in which it's shared mm -hmm. right, with the sun. And if yeah. it's an ability, like if it's genuinely ability, then there's a possible world where he exercises that ability. Because if he's, there's no possible world where he exercises, it's not much of an ability, right? And if there's a possible world where he exercises that ability, then in that possible world, there's a, a grandson of God or maybe it's the Holy Spirit or whatever, but then that being is going to exist in every possible world, right? But if that property is shareable, then there, the worry is there's going to be a possible world where that third divine person get, has that property mm. too, right? Unless there's a reason that it's just logically impossible. Mm. Um, I mean, with the, with the Richard of St. Victor kind of argument, the idea is kind of, well, you don't need to generate any further divine person. So they just stop there because there's no further benefit. But my worry is that if it's just possible for the, the ability to generate a divine person to be shared, then you should end up with an infinite regress of divine persons or anyway, an infinite series of divine persons. And uh, the, the Cappadocian view is clearly that these properties can't be shared. Like Gregory of Nyssa is explicit about that. They're simple and unshareable, he says. And so that's the idea is that this is what individuates the person. So the, the father's ability to generate a divine person is, that's just his personal property that, that individuates him in particular. Um, so I, anyway, that's my, my view on that. And if that's your view, if you think, if you work it that way so that it's, that is particular to the father. Um, so it's not shared in any possible world, then you don't get any further divine persons because then if the son generated a divine person, the son would then just end up being identical to the father because that's his property. And that, and by the way, I mean, that's, that's roughly something like that is roughly Photius's or one of Photius's arguments about the filioque was like, as soon as you make that shareable, uh, make it a shareable property, then you just get an infinite regress sort of. Yeah. So he, uh, my understanding of Swimmer, he defines the father as, um, the ungenerated being or that he doesn't have the extra bit that he is the being who generates right. the ungenerated one or the uncaused one. I think that's how he defines him. But interestingly, I think in his latest paper in 2018 on the social trinity, mm -hmm. he actually does not assume the filioque anymore on that. So he... <laughs> maybe maybe because he's orthodox. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Right. I think 
his earlier works, he actually yeah, said the need for this cooperation in bringing about the, the Holy Spirit. But I think in his latest work, he, he's able to have his argument, but without yeah. actually needing the son to be involved in the process. So he said I was just about to ask about yeah. that. But yeah. I, I was about to say, I think you could modify that anyway yeah. to not have Filioque. Yeah. And yeah. also... Yeah, you have um, a father generate the spirit and they, yeah it, the love but, but what's the interesting is I, I haven't read the full thing but i've seen this quote from uh demetrius dan Eloy where he makes a similar a similar point he doesn't put it quite so analytically but he's like you know one person on their own is lonely there's and you can't have love and then two persons is you know a bond of love but then like three persons is like the 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 highest community of love is what he says, which is which I was interested in hearing Swinburne yeah, say yeah. something so, similar. Yeah, yeah. The way Swinburne puts it is like the third person allows there to be unselfish love. So he right. says, "Yeah, that's exactly what Stan Eloy says, yeah, pretty yeah, much." Yeah. 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 So that I think that's the way he sort of argues it. So you don't require there to be this cooperation between the two persons, and that that could be sort of the other orthodox saying, "Hey, I put your orthodox <laughs> to him." I don't know, but. Um, <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't see how you couldn't incorporate that into an argument for why there would be three persons rather than like four, five, six. I think it could work. I think if you modify it, it could, it could work. What do you think, Bo? I mean, I guess uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm following what you're asking, but I mean, it, it seems like you could, uh, in other words, it seems like you could have a model where the father generates the son and the spirit um, because of this desire to have love right uh but you don't have to have the son involved in the generation of the spirit yeah is that what you're asking well, yeah yeah because yeah, so one of the arguments it, often thrown at us is like oh why aren't there not, not not the question so much why doesn't the father generate a third person but more so just why three why not just four five just kind of oh, a blunt okay. question yeah like, yeah my, I mean, my bigger issue is like, how do you, how do you get to three? <laughs> um, because I think you have to have a distinction between begetting and proceeding. Um, so oh, my, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Why not just two? Yeah, I mean, like that's the other yeah. flip side of the coin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, here my my thing is like, look. So for the the same reasons that there can only be one God, in the sense of the father one, Archie and Arcos, like, because, uh, I mean, if you had a second God, right, they'd both be perfect and ah, say, uncaused, right? So there'd be nothing to individuate them. They don't have matter and things like that. So there, there'd be nothing to individuate them. So then if you also have one son of God, right, if you, if you tried to have more than one son of God, it'd be the same kind of argument. Like, what would individuate them? They're both going to be per intrinsically perfect beings and they're both going to be caused by the father. So there's, there's nothing to end. There'd be nothing to individuate the sons of gods. They're going to be one only begotten, right? Son of God too. So the real, the, the bigger trick I think is how do you get a third person? And you have to, I think you have to say like Gregory Nazianzen does it just, these are some kind of two different relations and we don't know maybe what the difference is between begetting and spirating, but those must be different somehow. I mean, you can try to make, make a case like why there's two different kinds of causation or maybe that there's two different divine properties or something that kind of lead to causing another divine person or something. But I think that's the bigger issue because the, then then I think it's just a question like what would individuate them? If there was a fourth divine person that was generated by the father, like how would that fourth divine person be distinct from the son or the Holy Spirit? Like what would make that, what would be their idioma, right? What would, what would individuate them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, summation thoughts on the debate for me. Um, I think Josh did really, really well. I think, um, oh yeah, one thing we didn't talk about was kind of just this slight, slight ambiguity with the saying essential, whether you meant yeah nature or whether you meant Proper to this thing. to this hypostasis or so. Um, yeah, that was the only other thing. But I think you did really well. I think it was awesome seeing 
Muhammad Hijab encounter this for the first time, I was like, it's what I've been, I've been waiting. <laughs> good, good, I'm sure good. Bo's been waiting too. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, no, that was interesting. I, I, I do think it's interesting that it, it seems like there's a pattern here of like when people hear about that view, they seem to not have much of a like actual response to it, except to say like, well, I'm not sure that's really Trinitarian. Like they're, they're going to question its credentials or whatever, but, but that just seems like it, it's just based on, they don't know the history. Like they, they haven't looked at the primary sources and they haven't kept up with recent scholarship and that sort of thing. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I, I do think I was saying before, like when, cause it does throw people back because then, the majority, because what I do realize at the corner is that they do have sort of like a set arguments in their mind that they're going to use against Trinitarians. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are like, oh, where's Trinitarianism in the Bible? Or, you know, where's this tripersonal God? And, oh, look, tripersonality doesn't fit with scripture and there is no sort of, um, there's no Trinitarianism that sort of stems from the, the first to the fourth century. And so for me, it's like when they realize that there's this actual view, mm -hmm. like, they're like, what am I going to say next? Like, because oh yeah, it does fit with scripture, and actually, well, yeah. second century did say this, and then the third century did say this, and the fourth century. So it's like it just undercuts a lot of arguments. And so, for me, I think I'm so happy. Like for a channel like what you guys, you know, your channel, and and specific, specifically yourself as well, Doctor Branson, like getting this view out. I think it's specific at the lay level. It's going to be really, really yeah. fruitful. Or I think yeah. apologize and just Muslim Christian dialogue and, and Christian dialogue with other religions as well to say actually this is a, a historically grounded view which fits with scripture mm -hmm. with, with, our, with the creeds so uh, I mean you're going to have to reformulate a new kind of objections because it doesn't apply in this, this specific Trinitarian context um, My experience is when you when you nail them on this uh, monarchia and energies and the different terms of God, which um, I think I, I will make a video on why even Islam has to admit that God is used in different senses, but uh -huh. um, in Arabic. Uh, and I, I'm actually going to need your help for that, Bo, with Greek, because I want to make kind of a comparison. Yeah. But um, my experience is when you nail them on it and they realize they don't really have any more objections to it, uh, they'll just shift to Christology. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I noticed that with Unitarians too. It's the same thing. It's like, well, let's start talking about Christology now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Which is, true. um, yeah. Next for, yeah. So for study enough, for, for me personally, I, well, I'm finishing up my Cappadocian stuff. Yeah. Actually, let's 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 end the stream and talk about this off stream. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for attending. I hope it was fruitful. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Josh, for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Oh. Might have you on again in future if you're up for it. If there's yeah. Yeah. No, so. great. I had a great time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Bye, everyone. See you guys.